Okay. So the next, um, the next, let's say hour at least, I would um, now give you a couple of introductions of uh, open source libraries and tools, how you can get started with DGGS. And then it will, of course, depend on your use case. Um, so that's what we're going to play around with a couple of those. Okay, so I will share my screen. This is my browser here. And we have the chat. From the chat, the URL is a, is a GitHub repository. And this GitHub repository points here, right? So, and this is basically a repository that has bundled lots of stuff that we can start as the so-called binder notebooks. So my binder is an online platform. Many of you hopefully already know that, um, where you can um, package software and run them uh, basically in, in, in a free container setting, which is often used to you know, prepare notebooks and to share notebooks. So, and I've prepared several things. Um, the, as I explained, the DGG Grid software from Kevin Saar, which was introduced in the first presentation. Um, I put an effort and actually managed to put it also into this binder notebook. Um, I'll explain a little bit more to that. Then. Um, these two notebooks with is working with Uber H3. And this H3 intro is really short. It's just to provide some basic concept with the API. And um, then one nice workflow of spatial data analysis is actually done here in H3 because H3 is one of the most um, sort of mature libraries. And it has actually also a bunch of spatial data analysis um, functions, whereas DGGrid is mostly a tool to construct um, DGSs and fill them with data. And um, I've also put in an example with uh, our heel picks. I'm not sure if we, we, we get to that, but um, I would like to start. So everybody of you who wants to join, we start the first binder notebook here, launch binder from this URL. Um, and let me know if my screen, if, if it's too coarse resolution, uh, too high resolution, I'll um, I might also reduce my resolution here a bit, like something like this. So what happens here is if we start this, this binder, my binder platform will, um, you know, will load the prepared container image and then we'll launch it as a server. So right now you only see a view on it, but um, it will, any second it will start it as an actual online notebook. Those those Jupyter notebooks, maybe hopefully many have of you already been working with it. It sometimes takes a, a, a moment, but uh, no worries to to um, yeah, not to be worried. And so this first notebook here, the DGG grid tool. For that, I would also um, like, I think it's, it's linked here also. So the um, software, DigiGrid, is actually available on GitHub. As you can see, this is the latest repository and it's still developed. Kevin Saar is one of the developers and has um, put all the information. Um, and there's a big manual here, a PDF file, which, um, really provides all the information how to use this tool. Now, this tool is a command line tool. And the way it works is you create a meta file, of basically a file with commands, what it should do, like should it bin data, which um, DGS uh, type to construct and so on. So that is not immediately um, sort of intuitive to get started to work with that. But I'm mentioning it because once you get sort of the basic understanding, it is quite a powerful tool to um, 
make statistical um, sort of data um, uh, summaries. So what I did in order, for, so now you saw it's started here like this, and each cell, each of those cells, they can be run with this run button. Okay. If you have uh, any any, if there's any um, questions you have in between, uh, just just put it in the chat or or speak up. Let me know if I can be of any assistance. If there's something that is not working for you, okay. Okay. So we are having um, this first notebook. So in this DGG grid tool, here's all the information you need. So what I did, I did a little, I wrote a really humble Python wrapper around it so we can uh, use it in Python because currently I do all, um, most of my spatial data work in Python. There is also an R adaptation, as I mentioned before in the slides. So and that would be um, DGG grid R. For those who are immediately interested, but although I shouldn't, I shouldn't distract you, but you, you know, you deserve the information. <laughs> um, and this is this is a bit more advanced, where you can use where you yeah, it's this typical binning. You know, you make the aerial summary for those areas, and because they are equal area. The summary is already normalized, which is which is a very useful typical thing, and it's global. So, um, and the R tool is already is using um, directly the functions within GGGrid, whereas um, the Python version is uh, basically preparing this meta file and running it for you. So, one problem was to actually package um, uh, GGGrid for um, different operating systems. So don't ask me how I came across in, in a quite useful way to do it with Julia, the Julia language. The package system in the Julia language um, was really easy to, to get this included. I've been struggling with a Conda recipe for a while. And um, yeah, because I'm also most, mostly working on, on Windows, although I can also use with Linux. Anyhow, um, in this notebook, it is, it's, it's quite the, the example how I would currently also use it on my computer or other computers. I installed Julia and then I installed the, my, my package Julia DGG grid package. And then it just means I have the compiled binary then ready as the command line tool. That's the only thing we need. So I would then run. So this is actually using the Python Julia interoperability bridge to, um, so this takes usually a, a few seconds. Um, so what it does, it builds sort of uh, a, an API bridge with the, the Julia language, which is also bundled here, but we don't have to program in Julia or do anything. The only thing is why I currently use this as a, as a vehicle to access, easy access a, a binary of a compiled binary for whatever platform. So we build this Julia interface and then we just say, we load this module. And then from this module, we'll need its, its library pass because it needs also some GDAL in the background. And then so we update um, our envi an environment because it needs access to those paths. And then it will give us the path to the actual um, tool. Yeah, so if we do it here just for the, for the sake of it, what happens? Um, This is just a string and it says where on the computer or in this time, this image here, the, the tool, the command line tool DGG grid is sitting. So what I could do now is I could uh, also run this and it will, it will basically give an error of course, because there's no meta file. Yeah, meta file name. So we can now run this as a normal command line tool. And if you would do it on your computers, on your personal computers, you would actually have this as a co already compiled command line tool. If you don't want to compile it yourself, of course, you can always compile it yourself. Um, here's the source code, <laughs> but there's no binaries available. That's why I prepared this way for you. Okay. So, and so now what I did, I have this little wrapper here, DGG grid 4 pi. 
And it's really just a, a thin high level sort of that runs basically some of the functions and you can run to create the polygons and you say which, which um, DGTS system at which resolution. And then we can just start looking a little bit um, and, and uh, what we can do with it, okay? So um, here, so now we have to have just this instantiating, this is like the runner that knows where the tool is and we want to see some of the locks. So we do this one and well, this one we actually don't need anymore because we have that already. So, and then one of the first things we wanna just do is um, just to start experimenting. So we can, again, if you want, you can look into the um, DGG grid manual, which is um, quite big, but here you can basically see which type of um, DGGS types you want to use, you know, a percher for triangles, a percher for diamonds, a percher three hexagons, a percher four hexagons, a percher seven hexagons, mixed. Let's say because this wrapper is not mega smart, um, those ones, the basic ones, they work okay-ish. The other ones I haven't tested so much. Okay, and then resolution, Resolution will be interesting because um, as you have seen, the cells, you go in and out. This is this meta file, all the things that you can configure. And here's one example um, statistics file. And we can generate those statistics also for ourselves. So if you would take equal area, a Percha 3 hexagon, at the different resolutions covering the whole globe. That's the idea. Yeah? So then you would have, um, if you take only like the top resolutions, you have really, really few cells only, right? And they cover each cell, each cell, hex area per, per hexagon is of course quite large. And, um, and the, the higher we go in the resolution, you know, the finer the cells become, the more cells we have and the smaller the cells become. So this is something we can, we can calculate also ourselves. So let's assume if you have seen here, we take just triangles at a really small resolution, or actually high resolution, and then you run it. And you see, this is the normal command line output that you would get. So this is all the parameters that would also be possible to set in this meta file. So it can be very specific. And what it what the tool does itself is because I said I used in GeoJSON. So this is actually a GeoJSON file. Yeah. So in this file, you can actually, um, if you generate it on your computer, you can already use this file. But what I do this in this integration here, I make it a GeoPandas, GeoData frame. So GeoPandas is a really widely used um, library for for geospatial data processing in python and it's like a data frame and based on a pandas python pandas data frame where each row is basically a feature in gis feature with um, attributes and uh, the geometry and the whole data frame is basically the spatial data sets where they all share the same coordinate reference system so this is then how it would look like Right, so it's just the, all the polygons are just counted through, and they have a, as you can see, a normal Letlon WGS84 geometry, so 1,280 um, polygons. So obviously, presumably triangles, because we said um, the yeah, topology is triangle 40. So. One of the issues when using global data in our normal, uh, let's say normal um, GIS environments, and this here is now no exception. So we created the geometries for such a global reference system, but now we put it actually into our normal GIS. So, so in a way right now we're taking a little bit away, but it's for, you know, just getting the handle, getting the feel for DGGS systems. So it has a plot function. We can also do something like 
line uh, line width slash zero dot five, for example, and it now plots. Um, you can also make it. I think uh, we take each color and make this uh, black. Maybe it's not really beautiful, but. Then you see that the main problem that we often also have in normal GIS, also in QGIS, um, is that those geometries that cross the datum line, and of course, because we cover the whole globe in in equal uh, in equal shapes, tessellated, then there's always some that cross the datum line, and then it looks really ugly. So, and one of the well. For visualization purposes, one of the stupid tricks I'm, I'm showing you right now is um, to just take some of these out, just in order to get the visualization nice. Because in the end, we still want to see our nice data, right? So there's another interesting um, uh, plotting library in in pandas uh, in Python, that is uh, called GeoViews, and GeoViews um, gives us access to some nice um, um, visualization capabilities. So here I'm saying we're using matplotlib because we want to just generate a uh, PNG, so we don't want to do it interactive. But GeoViews can also use Bokeh and HoloViews as a backend, and then you can uh, have nice interactive sort of slippy map style. Okay, so we do the import. And so what we do here is feature um, so those are actually included already in the um, in the core library. So then you can really easily plot a, a globe. That that's why I'm actually going here because I really want you know that we get some nice globe plotting. Because if we talk about global data, we want to see nice globes. Okay. So and what we can see is the ocean as polygon, or as a feature, the coastline and the land. Those are coming just from here. So right now, this doesn't have any data as such. Yeah. Um, so now if we would take our data frame, so in order to use the data frame in GeoViews, we have to sort of convert it into, into it, its sort of local graphics representation. And for that, we say take our data frame and represent it as polygons that are basically compatible with, with GeoViews. So here's our data frame. Right now, we don't have any data dimensions. That's why it's empty. And we take a, again, autographic. So in this way, by the way, you can also center on, on a different, so autographic is you know this view, and it's centered here on, currently actually on Estonia here. So as the, um, the, Conference is uh, in, where is it actually in Crete, officially? In Crete. <coughs> it says, so what is here? What is here? And we just take, you know, these two coordinates just for the, for the fun of it here. So we take um, longitude and latitude. Right. Right now we can't see anything nice because our our polygons, uh, our triangles, again because they're crossing the datum line. They're really messing our nice view up, right? So let me copy this here for now here. At least that you can see the, the globe. Yeah, you see it's now a bit further down here. It's sort of focused here somewhere. Italy, so Greece here, so my apologies. <laughs> okay, so um, so one of the issues now just um, to, to do this uh, nice globe plotting is um, 
I just make something here that basically just checks if one polygon here, ins and outs, is crossing the date line. Yeah? So it's just, you take the geometry, the exterior ring, and then for each um, coordinate in the exterior ring, it just checks if, uh, if they're crossing the date line, basically. So this is uh, not beautiful, but it's um, at least practical. So and then, of course, we apply the function. We get a right or wrong, a true or false. And then um, we only select those ones, this GeoPandas not, not, notation where we, which don't cross. And then we do another plotting again. Then you see those ones were the ones that, that, that crossed the datum line. But now um, at least, you know, we could filter some of those out. So, it, and, and the smaller the resolution goes, the smaller the resolution goes, the um, the easier, the, or the less visible it will be, right? And then also, you know, all Robinson projection. So this would be how it looks on the world. So what we could do is, of course, um, uh, once you start, you know, filling those with data, then you would collect, which is the, the um, VDIMs would then be your, your column where you have your, vertic uh, your, um, your data, your data column against which you want to do some coloring. And um, then you can also generate those ones. Uh, so this is population data um, loaded into that. And um, then you can build your, your, uh, your globe. So this is the, the very first general sort of uh, helper sort of again, because this, this overall concept has, has a lot of different things going on. So here, this is just using the tool and dealing with some of the pains that, that, that come when you get started. You think you have a nice globe geometry and you can't see it actually nicely. Okay, so um, are there any, any direct questions or was there anyone where, where it didn't work? So as you can see, the um, this online version has quite a limited amount of RAM, but once you have the packages um, available also on your computer, you can also do it yourself. So this is a here and in, in this um, in this repository, you've prepared this um, environment YAML file. This is basically the Conda Conda environment, Conda Forge. Here's some nice um, libraries, GeoPandas, Jupyter Notebook, plotting. And then we also have here H3, DGG Grid for Pi, and um, RealPix DGS Python library. And here we install, uh, the, the package installs Julia. And then from Julia, then you would then only have to install these three packages. But that, that's maybe already leaving it um, a bit Okay, so that was sort of the first little dabbling how to make a, a globe. So technically, we could now sort of restart the thing and we would uh, here, we take maybe ICR7H. And you see, Project 7 will already have much bigger. Um, so we make maybe a resolution 4 to make it even. So we just reuse the, the variables. So now it's 24,000 cells. Yeah, it's not only 1,000 cells, 24,000 cells. Of course, this will again look uh, really stupid. Oh God, plotting 24,000 polygons was already a bad idea. <laughs> so this import here. Um, then we do our crossing here. So this takes now a moment longer because it's checking the geometry for each of those. And then let's see how this would look like.
in the meantime, I would quickly refer back to the menu here. So this DGG Grid tool has only four or five basic um, operations, where the main is, of course, grid generation, where you define your DGGS type. You can also sub to say only for an area. Yeah, you can only say, for example, for my country. Yeah, you can say only for um, for the um, for you give it a polygon or a bounding box, and it will only create the, the grid for this area. Address conversion, you can basically addresses, long LUTs, and cell IDs. You can basically convert that back and forth. You can do grid statistics, where you can say for this and this DGS system at that resolution, what would be the grid statistics be? Yeah? And um, then point value binning and presence absence binning. Those are actually the powerful features where we would give it, a, for example, a CSV file with loan LUT and the data value, and then it could be your observations. And it would find always the points, you know, because it's a, set, it's a so-called indexing, uh, place indexing, right? So if you say um, my DGS system is resolution um, four, that means cells are so-and-so big. And then you give it, I don't know, a point cloud or just a bunch of observation points. Yeah, and I would then just, create those um, grids, grid cells, and, and aggregate the values for those um, based on your, on your point data. So that, that's what point value binning is. And presence absence binning extends it to the point that it only creates those cells that um, uh, where there's data. So unfortunately, these two are not implemented, but these three are already implemented in this Python wrapper. Okay, so now this looks already a bit nicer. So if we now also turn this to, 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 well, it takes too long otherwise. So now imagine if you would now have um, a data value in here, uh, like the, um, you know, like population data, because it's based on some point data. So one thing that, that is done, for example, um, is to to for for raster data or for vector data you always have to consider how do i get this data into a ggs and and i think this is something we can discuss even more so in in the end um but one way is of course from rasters from rasters you can create the xyz the point um representation where it only has the centroids and the centroids are then led lines and the data value from the rasters uh, so with gdal for example you can convert a raster into point, a point file, basically. And um, alternatively, if you want to have a higher resolution, you could um, create the grid at first here, like we have done here. You create the grid, and you take the centroids of those, and then you have a bunch of points, and then you can use raster statistics, zonal statistics, or point query to um, get the data uh, also in, but this is now a bit uh, uh, difficult to do directly here on the on the um, on this small um, notebook here. Okay, so the next thing I would like to show you then is to uh, is to do some actual data work with H3. But as you remember in your uh, in the initial presentation, uh, H3 uses the gnomonic projection. So they have less of a promise of equal area. That's why I think DGG grid for, for statistic binning, which is area normalized because each cell almost has the same area. This is uh, something you should, uh, you need to consider, of course. Okay, so um, I'll close this one. And then I would go here to the second one, H3 intro.